So number four first. To me, these are these are the the hardest ones. Number four when we're dealing with. Oh yeah, good call. Thank you. Too much stuff going on here. Okay, that should be popping up. <clears throat> so number four is a cone, and the cones are the ones that involve the most work. They're a little tedious. You want to be very, very careful when we are dealing with these. Um, so as we kind of go through this, it says water is running into a conical tank at a rate of, and then, so a couple things as we talked about yesterday as we reviewed some things. We want to identify sort of what kind of a shape are we working with, and this is the case going to be a cone. When you see the nine with a unit of feet cubed per minute, that's giving us, in terms of a variable, that's the change in volume with respect to time, and that is nine feet cubed per minute. That also means we probably want to deal with the volume of a cone, which is one third pi r squared h. So we can get that from the first sentence. It's saying that the point, the tank is standing point down. So I would draw this in. Again, most of these you want to draw in a little figure. So draw in your cone. It has an overall height of 10 feet. So from top to bottom here, our height is 10 feet. And then a base radius of five feet. So that means that our biggest circle at the very top here, the radius of that circle is five feet. All right, then it says, how fast is the water level rising when the water level is 15 or six feet deep? So there's water going into this tank. It's obviously going to be filling. That's why our volume is increasing at this rate. And then the question then is, how fast is the water level rising? So in terms of what we are looking for, we're looking for the rate of change of our height, which would be the dh dt. And we're going to do it when the water reaches a height of six feet. All right. So similar to yesterday, we have our equation. We've written down all the things we know and everything that we're supposed to find. So from this point now, we get into the derivative. So we take the derivative of these with respect to time. We actually did this one yesterday. Um, the derivative requires the product rule. So again, I'm going to do the one third pi r squared and then the h as my two separate terms. So the derivative of the first term would have given us a two thirds pi r and then the derivative of r. And then the second term should stay the same. <clears throat> product rule we add, leave the first term alone. The derivative of the h would just be dh over dt. Then like we talked about yesterday, if dh, if dh dt is what I'm going to be looking for here, then this variable here should be the only variable that we want to have left over. We better be able to come up with everything else. All right, so let's go through what we know. dv dt we were given, that's 9, so we can plug that in there. And then two thirds pi's, those are constants. Our r we don't know, the rate of change of r we don't know. We do know we're gonna do this when the water reaches a height of six feet, so that we can plug in the six. Where the equal comes from, and then plus one third pi, and then once again, we run across the variable r that we do not know, and then we have the dh over dt. <coughs> Sort of. So we know the overall radius. So for those in the classroom, um, Alex asked, don't we know the radius? So the issue with this is we know the overall radius. So we know the radius of this cone overall. What this question is saying is when the water level reaches a height of six feet deep. So let me do this in red. So when this reaches a height of six feet deep, so let's say that's right about here. The radius that we are talking about is what's the corresponding radius at that particular time. Okay, so now we do want to figure that out. Obviously, that's something that we need. So the hint that goes along with these that you're definitely going to want to know and make a note of. Um, in a cone, the radius and the height keep the same proportion throughout the entire cone. So with every single cone problem that you're going to do, you're going to set up this ratio. And the overall ratio, we are going to, in terms of what Alex is saying, we are going to write the overall ratio for that overall cone. So our radius at its greatest is 5, 
and the height at that time would have been a 10. So in a more succinct way, what this is saying is my height is always twice my radius or my radius is always half of my height. It doesn't matter where we are at. So if I then know that my height is going to be six, you could probably do this in your head, but we also, if we just use this proportion, if I now go ahead and replace the height with a six, we could do this algebraically and then solve that for R real quick. So multiply your uh, five over, and we find that our R is equal to a three. There's two places for R, so we're gonna put three into both of those locations. While you could have done that in our head, the other reason we wanna do our proportion is the other thing that we are still missing right now is the DRDT. So by setting up this proportion over here, if I ultimately want a dr over dt, what I'm going to do is solve this for r. Right, hold on, though. let me change the 6 back to a generic variable h. Solve this for r. So if I multiply this over, and again, this pretty much just tells us what we already know, that our radius is one half of our height in this problem, 5 compared to a 10, so the radius is always half. But now what I can do is take the derivative of this as well, and wouldn't now dr dt just be equal to one half of dh dt. From there now, we're gonna go ahead and take this and we're gonna substitute that in. It's not a great way to go about, it. I mean, it's, it doesn't give us everything we need, but we at least now have this as a one half dh over dt. So now notice what's happened. We're solving for dh dt, so we already had one of them. So even though we produced another one, isn't that now the only variable that's in play? So now it's just a matter of cleaning it up, combining some like terms, just doing the algebra to get the DHDT isolated. So that's our next step. So let's clean these up. Let's see here. So in this first one, so I'm talking this right here before we do our plus, this three and this three should cancel. And then if I did half of six, I'm gonna do this one half times six, that's a three, and then we have a two, that should all just become a six pi, along with that DHDT. In this second one, three squared is a nine, and then I want one third of nine, or just nine divided by three, so that should be a three pi DHDT. And then notice how those are now like terms that we're gonna be able to combine into a 9 pi dhdt. Divide by the 9 pi, so 9 divided by 9 pi should just end up as a 1 over pi. When you do that assignment tonight, when I look at it, when you take your little quiz tomorrow, as I mentioned yesterday, the unit is going to be a point in and of itself, so we just want to make sure that we don't forget it first and then make sure we label it correctly. This should tell us our units, whatever our height would be getting measured in, and it should be feet. We have that here. That's our numerator. And then our time was what? It's minutes. All right, and then that would be our final answer. So the cones just have a lot of stuff going on. And when you're gonna do the product rule every time, that one third pi r squared h, you get a lot of variables. There's just a lot of going on there. So that's why those tend to have the, the biggest issues. So just be careful with the minutia of all of that and not make a mistake somewhere along the way. You will definitely get one of these for homework. You will definitely get one of these on the quiz. All right, the columns. Okay, number five. So the hot air balloon rising straight up from a level field is tracked by a range binder 500 feet away from the point of liftoff. So let's draw that in. So we have our balloon is up here and then we have our range finder over here and he's tracking it, um, the R's distance is going to be 500 feet. As this balloon is gonna be going up, then this angle of elevation from this to the balloon would obviously be changing the whole time. We're going to evaluate all of this when this angle of elevation, so we'll call that theta, we're gonna do it when that angle reaches 45 degrees, so pi over four. 
You are then told the angle is increasing at a rate. So the way we identify angles with a variable is theta. So if I want the rate of change of that angle, we would call that d theta over dt, and that is 0 0.14. If you have your calculus, I'm going to want you to try this too because this gets a little messy also. <clears throat> Last thing, what is the rate of change in the balloon or how basically how fast is the balloon going up? So if the question is, what is the rate at which the balloon is rising? The balloon we identified as a variable b, so we are looking for db over dt. All right, that's what we're trying to find. So a right triangle, I said yesterday when we deal with right triangles, it's either going to be the Pythagorean theorem or it's going to be a trig function. If you have an angle involved, which we clearly do right here, uh oh, yeah, right here, then most likely the Pythagorean theorem isn't going to do you any good if we have to incorporate an angle. So we're probably dealing with our trig functions. So the whole Sokotoa thing pops up. If this is our reference angle, and these are the two sides that we know, and how we reference those from that angle, don't we know the opposite and the adjacent? So since it's the opposite and the adjacent that we are given, we would want to set up a tangent problem and say that the tangent of that angle should be the balloon's length over the rangefinder's length. Didn't happen in number four, but another thing we talked about yesterday, and it really will play a role in keeping this one simple and nice. If any of those three variables, if any of the variables in any of our problems are constants, then you want to plug that in right away. In number four, we didn't have to worry about it. Here, you really want to identify that there's a constant or this can get really, really messy on you very quickly. Which one of these is never changing? Which, which variable is never going to be changing? The R, good. So the balloon is just going up. <clears throat> this guy's standing here. So this horizontal distance, if the balloon is going straight up vertically and he's standing here, that does not change. So what that allows us to do, we don't have to worry about taking the derivative right now of that variable because we know that variable doesn't have a rate of change. So we can plug in the value of R right away as 500 feet. Okay. Then you can do your derivative now, totally fine. However, I would recommend, just because it's a little bit easier for people to see, that we would just multiply this 500 over. Because I think the derivative is now easier to take for this equation versus the previous one. All right, so do that. Keep it there. Actually, do that derivative. I'm going to see what we get. There's a common mistake here that people make. And we'll see if you make that common mistake. So the 500 we drop down. Remember, this is a chain rule question. The derivative of the outer term of tangent would be secant squared, and then you leave the inside alone. But then what people tend to forget is we still have to do the derivative of the inside, and the derivative of the inside is the theta. So the derivative of that theta should then give you the d theta over the dt. And that's this here is what people tend to forget. On the other side, that should be nice. The derivative of the b should just be the change in b with respect to time. And then slowly but surely we're getting to where I want you to plug this into our calculator to see if we can actually do this so that we can be efficient with it. What we're looking for is dbdt. I can get it. So if that's my answer, this should be the only variable left. So that's nice. It's already isolated. So all we really need to do to answer this is to take our angle, which we know is pi over 4, multiply that by our d theta dt, which is 0.14. Whatever that evaluates to be is our answer. So take a second and make sure we can do this. We're going to use our calculators a lot now moving forward. You want to be pretty efficient and be able to do this. See if you think that equals. It's actually a nice number. So if you get a nice number, there's a reasonable chance you did it right. You could do that without a calculator. If we really wanted to review some trig stuff, we could do it without. But I kind of want to see if you know how to do it with.
and then label it. See if you understand how to label it. Anybody in here confident? You get a nice number that you're confident in. Plug it away. Okay, I'll do it this way. I'll tell you what you should get. And if you don't get it, then let me know and we can talk about how that gets plugged into the calculator. You should get 140. Okay, right, should we get that? Andrew? Yeah. Mr. Pena? Yes. How did you get the secant squared on the calculator? Um, so there isn't a secant on the calculator. So here's the order in which I would have done it. I would have actually have done this first. And since there isn't a secant on the calculator, you would want to do one over the cosine of pi over 4 because that's the secant of pi over 4. That's why we could do this without a calculator. We should be able to do one over that and then go through with that work. Then it's up to you. You could hit enter right now. And then whatever that answer is, just immediately square it. And then what you've just done is the secant value squared. And then whatever you have for that answer, the rest of it's easy. Just multiply by the 500, multiply by the 0.14, and then that should give you 140. Now, if you don't get it, I would check and make sure you are in radians. Because if you're not in radians and you're in degrees, you for sure won't get it. But then that gives us the 140. Devanchi, you get that time? All right. Units, it's just going to be whatever the length of B would get measured in. The B is just the height of the balloon. I think it was in feet. And then our time, what was that, in seconds? Minutes. So feet per minute. Okay, good with that. Any issues? Calculator issues? Okay. Then our last one, number 17, or number 7. All right, it starts out as kind of that classic, there's a ladder against the house question that every calc book starts with, with these questions. But then there's going to be kind of a follow-up to this. So it's really kind of two questions in one. So it says a 13-foot ladder is leaning against the house when its base starts to slide away. So then I would draw that in. Here's our house. Here's our ladder. And then start labeling the stuff that we know. Our ladder is 13 feet long. Its base is going to start to slide away. So there it goes. So we'll call this the B for the base. And then obviously, as this slides away, this is going to come down. Second sentence, by the time the base is 12 feet from the house, so we are going to do this when the base of the ladder has a length of 12 feet from the house. The top of the ladder is moving at a rate of 12 feet per second. So the top of the ladder is here. So when you're given the top of the ladder's rate of change, we've identified it, at least I have. You're using my variables as h. So that just gave us the rate of change in the length of h. The question is then asking at what rate is the foot of the ladder sliding away? So maybe you could have put F, I guess. I think that's what we did yesterday. I called it base. So what we're now trying to figure out is how fast is this distance changing? So that would be dB over dt. And then if you go to the next part, at what rate is the area change? That's a second question. So we don't want to deal with that just yet. So we're ready to answer this question. What is the rate of change along the base of the ladder? So it's another right triangle. Yesterday we did a Pythagorean theorem. Today we did a trig function. If you look around this diagram, nowhere is there an angle involved. If there was an angle involved, that's when we're probably going to be dealing with the trig functions. So in this case, without an angle to worry about, we're just dealing with a Pythagorean theorem setup. We take our derivative. You can put the twos if you want, but if you remember yesterday, we talked about how the twos, since they all have a two, we can just say that we're going to divide it out of there. So 
that's why there won't be any twos in front of any of these. Here's what we're trying to find, the DBDT. So everything else we either need to know or be able to figure out. So let's start plugging away. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. You guys can do the rest. Mike, you can see my word is frozen for a second. The rest of this I think you can do. So see if you can fill in all those variables while well, this. There we go. Hopefully you respond at some point. Yeah, so go ahead and fill that in. Yeah, make sure you take a minute. We've got plenty of time to do this one problem. Go through this all the way. See what you get for your answer. See if that answer makes sense. And then we'll see if you're right. If it doesn't make sense, think about maybe why it wouldn't. Then as you start getting your answers, because hopefully we're getting pretty close to that, think about what you're finding. We're finding the change in the length of B, comparing it to our changing time unit. Look at B here. Think about if B is getting bigger or smaller. B is getting bigger, correct? So if we're looking for the rate of change of B, you better make sure that we have a positive rate of change here. We better get a positive answer. And if we don't, we got to think, why did we not get a positive answer? Because I don't want to see on a quiz, oh, I'm just going to change that negative to a positive at the end. All right, we want to, the work should have just produced that. All right, let's see where we're at. Um, so if we start plugging things in, um, what do we know? Uh, the L is 13, so that's this. The B we said is 12, so we're going to put that there. The DHDT we said was 12 also. Um, so what we don't know is the H or the DLDT, so let's do the H first. We're going to do this. The ladder is going to be 13. The base is going to be 12, so this is one of your nice trip. I think you still learn triples, correct, in math 1, 2, and 3. So that's a nice triple of 5, 12, 13. So this has to be 5. Then we get to the right-hand side of this equation. So we talked about it yesterday. I've actually mentioned it earlier today as well. We could have, if you wanted to, we could have said that the ladder, isn't the ladder always going to be 13 feet? And because it's a constant, you could have plugged that in right away. So that if I let this be the 13 squared, so 169, when I took the derivative of this, wouldn't this have given us a zero then on the right-hand side? The reason we can do that is because now our issue with finding DLDT, and the reason I don't need to give that to you, is the DLDT stands for the change in the length of the ladder as our time is changing, and the length of the ladder is not changing. So that's where you would then come up with that same value of a zero. That's the rate of change of our ladder. So either way, the right-hand side just zeroes out. So what we would now have is the 60 plus 12 dBdt would equal a zero. Take your 60, subtract that over. And then right now, if you did the work that I did, what I was trying to hint at, we are going to get at this point a rate of a negative five. And then our units would be what? It's feet per second, but then we get this little negative sign. So now that I queued you in, hopefully we're able to work backwards and figure out where the negative should have come from. The negative should have come from where? 
the negative velocity was going down. Good. If we look at H, is an H going down? So the rate of change of H, even though there wasn't any word about decreasing, whatever, I don't give you that as a negative value, we really should have identified this as a negative 12. And then if this is a negative 12, this is a negative 60, I'm now adding 60 over, and then now we legitimately get this to be a positive answer versus having to change it at the end. And now I'm realizing there's a second question here and I should have written so big. So that's the answer to the first one. I don't know where I'm going to squeeze this last one in. Let's try to do it right here. Um, what did you get five for the value of H? Uh, we just did the Pythagorean theorem. Um, I didn't actually do the Pythagorean theorem, but and the reason I didn't is it's a triple. But if we did the Pythagorean theorem with, we knew B was 12. And we knew our length was 13. If we do the Pythagorean theorem, I promise you, you're going to get five there because this is one of your triples from last year. Uh, the three, four, five triple is a common one. A seven, 24, 25 is a common one. And then the one that we were dealing with here, the five, 12, 13 triple is also a pretty common one. So we didn't actually show the work. It's just recalling the triples. But if you wanted to show the work, that would have been right here. All right, so now, second question, that last sentence. Get these erased because that's where I'm going to do my work. At what rate is the area of the triangle formed between the ladder, the wall, and the ground changing? So now it's asking about this area in here, and we want to figure out what's happening to this area, what's its rate of change. So if that's what we're looking for, the rate of change in the area of a triangle, then what we need, try to create another space to work here, is the area of a triangle formula, and then that we know is one half base times height. <clears throat> what we're looking for in this problem is dA dt. So when I take this derivative, I will get the dA dt right away. Careful over here, recognize this as a product rule. One half B is your first term, H is gonna be your second term. So the derivative of the half B would just be one half and then dB dt, leave your H alone. Plus, then leave the one half B alone and then the derivative of H is dH dt. And then go ahead and finish this off because this should be pretty nice. The dA dt is what we look for. It's already isolated. It's just now a matter of plugging in all of your variables. And if I remember correctly, these are all given to us. You know all of these. You already have them written down in your paper. It's just a matter of assigning them to the right spot. So the one half we have, so here's my one half, here's this one half, and then I need the dBdt. That was the answer to the previous question, so that is five. And then we needed our height at that time. We had found that to be five also in the previous problem or in the previous work. The base was gonna be 12 at that time. That's this. And then the rate of change of the height was this negative 12. So that should give us, what, 25 halves minus 144 halves. So what would 24 would be 119. So that should be a negative, I think, negative 119 halves. Think about your unit now. We now have the change in area compared to our change in time. 
So now this unit, where we have feet, correct? Yeah, so it should be feet squared per second. So this is the answer to the second part of this. This was the answer to the first part. Come on, Lord. Okay, so with that, that is it. Let me just be clear on one thing. If you go to your to the Canvas page, you can find the assignment either at the Assignments tab or underneath the modules. You'll find it underneath those notes for today. There's two different ones, and these are different sets of problems. So you guys obviously are fifth period. So I don't think I have this in your packet either, if I remember correctly. So you're going to need to either print or just look off of your screen and do it on some blank pieces of paper. But you make sure you do the fifth period um, and then seventh period obviously do theirs. These are not the same problem sets. So just make sure you're doing the right page. All right. That'll be due tomorrow. If you have any issues with it, there may be a slight issue here or there. Then just find me second period tomorrow morning and I can make sure you're on the right path. All right. And then know there's a quiz tomorrow too. It's on this stuff. So if you do have some of these you're not sure about, definitely reach out to me before now and then so that if it appears on the quiz, you're able to do it on the quiz. All right, that's all I got. If you are home, you can check out. If you have any questions, you have a minute to ask. And then we'll see everybody tomorrow. All right, have a good night. Mr. Pena, when did you say the test was? Test or quiz? Tomorrow there is a quiz on just this, just 4.6, not the previous units. Okay. And then we will likely have a test.